So we're in day three for the Six Five Summit, and I have the pleasure of speaking with Cohesity. Um, the company's been around for over a decade, and it's focused on data, cyber, and business resiliency. And joining me is Dr. Z. Dr. Z, you're the America's field CISO for the company, yeah, correct? Yeah, that's great. Great. So, Dr. Z, how are things going? Things are going really well. Uh, I'm having uh, an enjoyable and but enlightening time uh, traveling around, talking with customers, and and seeing, you know, how they're trying to respond to the threats and the challenges out there. Sure. Uh, it's it seems like it's never been so overwhelming for a lot of organizations. Mm -hmm. You know, the fear of ransomware is still out there, sure. and a lot of organizations are taking steps, uh, very serious steps within their groups to to ensure that they're ready to respond accordingly. Well, that's a great segue into our first topic, and I want to talk about cyber resilience and. How do you make it tangible for, for organizations measure, and as well as measurable? Well, I tell you what, data protection couldn't be more important with the rise of generative AI, concerns around data leakage, the data that's used to train these large language models. And uh, that really kind of leads me to my first question. And it's like, I mean, how do you make cyber uh, resilience tangible and measurable in today's new age? Yeah, the, the, the conversations that I'm having with customers and, and, and groups is helping them understand that, okay, you've got the idea of replication, mm -hmm. okay, a functional A to B, I can do that, I can prove that. You have the function of my backups are good, I'm a checksum looks good. Mm -hmm. uh, but then on top of that, we start talking about things like disaster recovery, which brings more people and process and things in play sure. to the point now with attacks like ransomware, mm -hmm. with the concerns around AI and such, the business has to think of it as how can I respond to different events? You know, we have a lot of attacks. Last year, ransomware was over a billion dollars, uh, you know, paid. Uh, the statistics continue to show how rampant that is. Mm -hmm. But it could be, you know, a natural disaster. It could be the well-meaning stupid person. It, it could be, <laughs> you know, anything that brings yeah. a system down that affects the IT organization of keeping the revenue generating clock running. Sure. Right? Yeah. I mean, that's their job. That's their one job. Right. And so the idea of uh, replication is, is has to expand to the idea of keeping that business running. And that when is when we pull in not just the infrastructure team, mm -hmm. but the security team, the legal team, the finance team, the HR team. These are all critical stakeholders when it comes to yeah. you know, the notion of data protection. Right? Exactly. Yeah. And, and so what I ask customers a lot is say, what is, can you define a minimal viable company? Mm -hmm. So if you were totally down, what would you bring up first? Sure. What data does that include? What systems does that include? What people need to be part of that process? Mm -hmm. uh, to help the, the technology folks realize they have to get out of maybe their blinders mm -hmm. about what they do and understand the impacts of what the business needs to continue to operate. I mean, it's truly a team sport, right? You have to have all these stakeholders involved because, you know, if you only involve one or two, I think you're, you're going to miss what's, what's required. And the attack service just continues to grow. Oh. When you look at um, what's happening in OT environments that have traditionally been unconnected, now IoT is coming in, you know, to drive manufacturing automation and that sort of thing. When we, you know, as we're seeing a lot of reshoring of manufacturing, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, and it's like it, it presents a really unique challenge for organizations. And so, I'd love Dr. Z to get your your uh, thoughts on what are some practical tips to implement so that you focus on the right policies, processes, controls, and procedures. Historically, you know, the security team has written a policy and basically thrown it over the fence mm -hmm. and said to infrastructure or whatever, here's what Feel you have to that. comply with. Right, exactly. <laughs> you know, they become the department of no, yeah. and here's what you have to do, and don't don't bug me about it, just, just <laughs> make it happen. Right. And that's the, the barrier that has to break down mm -hmm. so that those plans, those discussions, have to be very comprehensive for the organization mm -hmm. to understand these are the threats, these are the things, these are the risks that we're looking at that we need to be aware of and, and take into consideration. Should this occur, how are we going to make this happen? So uh, when, when an event occurs, and again, it could be anything, but especially an attack of some kind, the first thing that breaks down is communication. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
often because a crisis plan that you've written and you've planned and you've tested sits on a SharePoint server that you now can't get to. <laughs> And you don't have, so well, what was Bob's phone number? And, and uh, the out-of-bounds type of communication process mm -hmm. needs to be somewhere on a piece of paper that somebody... Well, I was just going to say, I mean, do you need to print it off? I mean, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, we, we do need to think about that. Sure. So th that's the first step, is making sure that you can communicate out-of-bounds mm -hmm. with whomever you need to. And that, that will include... Uh, it might include law enforcement. It might include, uh, you know, legal or partners. Sure. Uh, it depends on your business model. It might include your franchisees. It could, you know, it depends on how you're doing business. Yeah. And so those are the first things to look at. Okay. Is number one, can we communicate? Uh, as I mentioned, the, mis the, the minimal viable company. Mm -hmm. Everyone has. I to like that. Thing. You know, like minimal viable product, minimal yeah. viable company. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 And, and everybody has to agree on that because yeah. when crisis happens. It's really hard to get consensus. Sure. Right. I mean, and everyone's frantic and you right. know, covering their butts. and <laughs> <laughs> From, The CISO gets thrown under the bus. I mean, you know. Which is unfortunate, <laughs> but yeah, that usually is what happens. Right? Yeah, it's unfortunately, it's true. Yeah. Uh, and so really bringing people together and saying, what are we going to do? Mm -hmm. uh, we, we've said, we get so tired of hearing, it's not if, but when sure. you're attacked, right? But yeah. it's, it is, we say it for a reason. Cliches got to be cliches for a reason. Sure. And so you have to stop thinking about uh, stopping everything. Mm -hmm. So as a security professional, you can't do that, mm -hmm. number one. Yeah. So what is the most important thing for you to protect? And then you have to understand how can we recover? What is response and recover all about? Mm -hmm. That has got to be the focus for organizations. Uh, one of the things I'm spending a lot of time with uh, this first half of the year is going into organizations and running a ransomware resilience workshop okay. where we put them through a scenario and right. we, we bring people in and we say, okay, you're the CEO, you're the CIO, you're the head of you know, HR or, 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 or PR or whatever. Uh, we give them a promotion for a short period of time. Sure. And we okay. say, okay, you've been attacked and it's a very immersive experience. Okay. And the hacker talks to you and you have to respond and it's like choose your own adventure type thing. And right. based on your responses, certain things happen. Mm -hmm. And what people learn uh, early on is they become very impotent. They become without ability to do much sure. or negotiate or control. Right. And that really opens their eyes. And then this, the second thing that, that uh, and probably the biggest thing that they come away with is they say, you know what, when we are talking about this in our groups, we do not have all the people in the room. We need to broaden out that discussion. Sure. Include all the stakeholders like we were speaking to before. Exactly. Yeah. And, but that's hard to do because we, we get so tech-minded about I, my process Right, and or that it's the responsibility of NetOps or SecOps. Exactly, and you're not you're not thinking about you know HR and legal and yeah and all the all the rest. And that's what we're trying to do is to give visibility. You know, and AI is just a component of that. Right, visibility into your data, both production and secondary data, so that you know exactly what's in your data. Do you have malware floating around somewhere? Have you been backing that malware up for the last? X number of days. What's your hygiene? What's your security hygiene? Yeah, basically. Exactly. Okay. But organizations need that type of visibility uh, because the, the, you know, well, IBM puts out a really good report, cost of a data breach report. Mm -hmm. Last year, they said the average time that malware is present, the average time uh, to, to determine that there's been an incident, mm -hmm. is the way they put it, mm -hmm. is 240 days. Wow. That's way too long. It is. It's way too long. And then you've got another three or four months of recovery after that. So you can spend the better part of a year right. dealing with an incident. Yeah. And when you look at it from a data perspective, you've got, uh, you've got malware, you've got anomalies, you've got things floating around in the air that you have backed up multiple times. So we're all about saying, look, here it is. We find it for you. We give you the ability to remediate, to work in concert with all of the security technologies that you have in place. Mm -hmm. We have a very strong set of APIs that mm -hmm. allow organizations to do that. So that in and of itself is helping to break down those barriers between the IT and the, and the infrastructure and the uh, sure. security teams. Yeah. 
big time. So we've really been, you know, talking about the human element and you mentioned stupid people like, you know, <laughs> and, you know, when you look at ransomware and you look at how that, that propagates, a lot of times it's socially engineered, right? Mm. And um, so I'm just wondering from, from your perspective, how, you know, you, you've mentioned a few things on, you know, wh what Cohesity does to sort of, you know, empower the human element to, to be more defensive, but are there some other considerations that organizations should be thinking about when, when you're know, focusing on the human element of this equation? Um, I'll ask organizations, I'll say, how many individuals in your group have high level admin access mm -hmm. to your systems, whether it's an authentication system or it's a, a, a cloud resource, how many? And I, I don't even let them answer. I give them the answer. Right. The answer is two. <laughs> right. Too many. Too many. Yeah. Because in, it evolves. Our, our organizations evolve to where somebody says, hey, we need to run this, this new project. And so I need, I need this access to Okta or whatever sure. it is. Right. Oh, okay. Okay. That's fine. And then we forget about the fact that Bob just got that access. Right. And so that really needs a hard look right. to say, what's the role and does that really require that kind of access? Mm -hmm. So we become lax often in our, our um, management of access to tools. Right. And that starts to just spread the attack surface. Well, what I also see too in organizations are orphaned applications yes. and orphaned systems that are allowed to remain do be, be dormant and then they become weaponized because a bad actor finds a way to get in and infiltrate that. So, I mean, what, what can organizations do? I mean, you know, to have that, that level of visibility, because it's oftentimes it's very, very difficult, especially a large enterprise that has hundreds of, you know, SaaS applications and systems, and, and some of it is legacy, some of it is modern. I mean, any recommendations on, you know, how organizations can, can manage that infrastructure? So. You know, it comes back to blocking and tackling. It, uh, we talk about this all the time. Yeah. You know, what's the default password? You know, change it from admin or password. Right. We still see it's that not one there. two three four. It's not one two three four. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's like uh, I came up, my, my son came up with Hot Pants Movie Buffet. I thought that was a great password. <laughs> Number one, you won't forget Very it. Very creative. And nobody will, re nobody can guess it. And right. you'll never forget it. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, to change that type of stuff. There has to be a continuous auditing process in that world to understand, yeah. you know, have we done those basic hardening processes? Uh, password, you know, organizations are working to go password less. Right. Uh, we, well, and a lot of a lot of companies like you know you've got Cisco with Duo. I mean, yeah, that, Cisco's that's, a good that, example. That's sort of the direction that, yeah. that a lot of infrastructure companies. Yeah, and so that now puts uh, you know a lot of uh, another layer of security in there, right. so we don't have that human element so much. Mm -hmm. uh, Capital One just went through this, and uh, we, I listened to them at the Executive Security Action Forum this week, mm -hmm. kind of outline their experience of doing it. And it was really fascinating, and and yeah, they had a lot of humans that were, you know, getting up in arms and everything. Sure. Um, but when people understand the ramifications of their actions, and, and I'm not saying that they're trying to be bad. It's just that right. they're, we're kind of lazy, right? We're all lazy. Right. We just kind of want to. We get in bed a lot of time. Yeah. We get desensitized to, yeah. you know, everything. But you look at the, the last year's uh, Caesars and MGM hack. Right. Oh my goodness! You you mentioned the the social thing. I think the term ransomware we could even argue is a misnomer because often there's no where there's no malware there's no software. Uh, case in point is MGM, right? right? We have a person someone uh, impersonated an individual that yeah. gave them high level Okta access, and then that gives them high level uh, Azure access. Right. So they basically, if you're a gamer, they basically were in God mode, right? Running around yeah. MGM's infrastructure, moving, moving laterally, um, right? Yeah, disabling um, keys to rooms, yeah, shutting down the casino. I mean, think about just you know the the opportunity, you know costs to to MGM, potentially the um, the patronage they're going to lose over time because I mean I saw some of those pictures. I mean there were hundreds of people in line that couldn't even get into the room, couldn't yeah. get on the elevator. Yeah, it just it was madness. It's it's yeah, and it just totally goes against our our normal ex expectations of things. The impact uh, is so far beyond um, you know what we think of as that. Well, I can't log in somewhere, so. 
we have to be diligent in things like um, how do we manage passwords, mm-hmm. uh, the multi-factor authentication, the uh, the role-based access control. Right. Yeah. These are the basic building blocks that organizations need to yeah. apply. And uh, is will also apply in the AI space, sure. in the use of AI. Mm-hmm. If people are scared to death, right, to <laughs> open it up to everybody, sure. well, then let's take a pragmatic approach to it. Let's apply the rules that we use around access to other tools right. to the use of AI, right. and that will help uh, reduce that threat uh, surface as well. I agree. You know, and you mentioned M- M- MFA. You know, one of the statistics that I've read is that, you know, 30 per, you know, 30% of organizations don't even employ multi-factor authentication, yeah, yeah. which that is like, that's frightening. I mean, that should be like the first thing that an organization consider. We did a, uh, a ransomware workshop and uh, they they publicly stated a number of months ago that their networks see 45 billion hits a day. Wow. And that they're on, that's a, they're on record of saying that. And it's just like, yeah. So how do you do that? One of the guys in the room when we uh, went through this exercise, you could just see, you know, kind of the light coming on. Mm-hmm. And he literally said, he, he raised his hand and made a comment. I get it now. I get it to understand why we put these controls in place. Because mm-hmm. even as a security professional who has a, a pretty good high level of responsibility at that organization, mm-hmm. he was like, you know, oh, I got to do this again. I got the MFA and blah, blah, blah. Everybody, you know, the fatigue. It's the there. friction. Yeah. 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 The, and, and he just like, I'm not going to complain anymore. No. You know. So unfortunately, fortunately, they didn't have to go through a real exercise, you know, for him. They went. They went through your workshop, right? right? Yeah. So, well, Doctor Z, thank you for uh, for sitting down with the Six Five uh, Media. Uh, it's been a really, really insightful uh, conversation, and I just want to let our viewers know: um, keep continue to tune in. We've got a lot of great content this week, and if you like this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. But thanks again, Doctor Z. My pleasure. Thank you.